If we want to go to heaven, we need a total transformation. We need it as individuals, and we need it as a church. And the time has come to speak about these things, because we are told that the straight testimony will cause the shaking. to have a total transformation. Well, this is another one of those unfortunate topics, Baal Peor. And some of it, of course, might seem repetitive, but uh, the history of the children of Israel was somewhat repetitive, wasn't it? And the reason for the series is also to tell us where we are in the stream of time. And in the previous lectures, you remember that we went 1844, gathering the people, 1888, the first opportunity. Then we saw that there was a later, second opportunity. Again, the children had to walk around Edom and around the nations and then eventually they got to the place where they could cross over into the promised land on the very borders of Canaan. Now the antitype, the Advent movement, has traced all of those steps if it has been past this step as well, well then we are at the very pinnacle of time when we will put our foot in the Jordan and cross over. And by faith, the walls of Jericho will fall. Not by might and not by power. And... Uh, I am sad to say that we as a church have even been through this experience. So we're on the threshold of eternity. And if I look at the prophetic scenario, I can hear the rumbling of the wheels of the Roman army coming to implement Sunday legislation for the second time. And if I look at the typological scenario, I can see the walk of the children of Israel having completed the entire typology of Israel. So both from the perspective of Babylon and the perspective of God's people, we've reached the end. And that is why I'm confident that we're going home very soon. And I believe God is gathering his people. He's gathering the remnant of the remnant. And so again, before I even start to talk about these issues, I am not doing this to condemn. I'm doing this to show the state and to call people back to God's people. I'm not running down the church. I'm trying to uplift the truth. And there's a difference. There's a difference. And the issue is we need a personal and a corporate transformation before we can take those trumpets 
and sound the herald and have a renewing of our spirit and our mind. Joined unto Baal Peor, be not deceived, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now before us the Alpha of this danger, the Omega will be most startling in nature. We've talked about some of these issues when we talked about the lecture Mordecai in the Gate. But that lecture concerned more the structure of the church as a whole. We're now talking about the spiritual aspect within the church. Well, this is Tal Deir Allah in the Vale of Chittim, where Balaam's curses were found on inscriptions. So archaeology, once again, confirms the Bible. Isn't that fascinating? So here are the archaeological excavations. With joyful hearts and renewed faith in God, the victorious armies of Israel had returned from Bashan. They had already gained possession of a valuable territory, and they were confident of the immediate conquest of Canaan. They felt good. You know, we also had our organizations, our structures, which gave arguments as to why we were biblically on the right course, why we were geologically on the right course. Didn't our church have all of these? Yes, we did. Only the River Jordan lay between them and the Promised Land. Just across the river was a rich plain covered with verdure, watered with streams from copious fountains. <laughs> it was paradise. Towers, palaces of Jericho the city of palm trees. On the eastern side, between the river and the high tableland which they were traversing, was also a plain, several miles in width, extending some distance. This sheltered valley had the climate of the tropics. Here flourished everything they wanted. This was great. It was great. But amid these attractive surroundings, they were to encounter an evil more deadly than mighty hosts of armed men or the wild beasts of the wilderness. That's the biggest problem right on the borders of Canaan. That country so rich in natural advantages had been defiled by the inhabitants. In the public worship of Baal, the leading deity, the most degrading and iniquitous scenes were constantly enacted. On every side were places noted for idolatry and licentiousness, the very names being suggestive of the vileness and corruption of the people. Wow. These surroundings exerted a polluting influence upon the Israelites. Their minds became familiar with the vile thoughts constantly suggested. Their life of ease and inaction produced its demoralizing effects. How many of us have television sets in our houses? How many vile, polluting thoughts are implanted in minds right on the borders of Canaan? And almost unconsciously to themselves, they were departing from God and coming into a condition whereby they would fall an easy prey to temptation. Sin doesn't look so exceedingly sinful if you see it every day. And even if you have a bleeper to bleep out the things, it still sticks. During the time of the encampment beside Jordan, Moses was preparing for the occupation of Canaan. In this work, the great leader was fully employed. But the people, this time of suspense and expectation was most trying. And before many weeks had elapsed, their history was marred by the most frightful departures from virtue and integrity. Can't happen to us. Can it? At first there was little intercourse between the Israelites and their heathen neighbors, but after a time the Midianitish women, they were also descendants of Abraham. Remember that? Jethro was a Midianite. 
Their appearance excited no alarm, and so quietly were the plans conducted that the attention of Moses was not called to the matter. It was the object of these women in their association with the Hebrews to seduce them into transgression of the law of God, to draw their attention to the heathen rites and customs and lead them into idolatry. These motives were studiously concealed under the garb of friendship so that they were not suspected even by the guardians of the people. I think these ladies had very short dresses, very low cut <laughs> in the front here. And I don't know, perhaps occasionally they had a little bit of ecstasy in their pockets or maybe something even hotter, I don't know. Now at Balaam's suggestion, a grand festival in honor of their gods was appointed by the king of Moab. Now we know the story of Balaam and Balak. He was to curse the Israelites. He couldn't do it. And so he eventually conceived this bright idea. It was secretly arranged that Balaam should introduce, induce the Israelites to attend. He was regarded by them as a prophet of God and hence had little difficulty in accomplishing his purpose. And uh, he was called by the Moabite kings. This is a sister church. A sister church. Protestant church. Great numbers of the people joined him in witnessing the festivities. Uh, do we in our church witness the festivities of the sister churches. Yes or no? They ventured upon the forbidden ground and were entangled in the snare of Satan, beguiled with music and dancing. Um, does that ring a bell? Do we have sacred dancing and uh, sister church music in our churches? Don't we sing more charismatic choruses than we sing hymns these days? I always say to the people, if you don't like the old hymns, then write something new. Ask God to inspire you. But why would you want to repeat over and over and over and over as God got a grammatically deprived mind <laughs> that we have to repeat to him over and over these silly little choruses that we sing to him? Ah, and they were allured by the beauty of the heathen vestals. We even find it today in our own churches that some of the leading brethren believe that they have to put on a Batman suit before they climb onto the pulpit. Have you seen them? Red togas and <laughs> stripes or whatever. It's so nice. And so we get an outward religion rather than a inward religion. I like the old reformers who said when you see vestments, gorgeous apparel in the place of the righteousness of Christ, run! That's what they said. They cast off their fealty to Jehovah as they united in mirth and feasting, indulgence in wine, beclouded their senses and broke down the barriers of self-control. Passion had full sway, and having defiled their consciences by lewdness, they were persuaded to bow down to idols. And they offered sacrifice upon the heathen altars and participated in the most degrading rites. Can't happen to us, eh? Wow. It was not long before the poison had spread like a deadly infection through the camp of Israel. So now the infection is in the camp. So first they were just observers. Oh, we're not members, we just have observer status. Have you heard that before? Have you heard that before? We have observer status. We're just observing. But then the infection spread into the camp of Israel. Those who would have conquered their enemies in battle were overcome by the wiles of heathen women. Churches. Women. Churches. That's how typology works. The people seem 
to be infatuated. The rulers and the leading men were amongst the first to transgress. Do you think it could be the same in the antitype? That the rulers and the leaders would be the first to transgress? Because it's obvious that the rulers and the leaders would be the ones to be invited to the Baal festivities. Isn't that so? What's the point of getting Joe soap? It's got no influence. And so many of the people were guilty that the apostasy became national, spread through the entire camp. Will it be the same with anti-typical Israel, yes or no? Yes. But these people still went through to Canaan, didn't they? They were right here on the borders of Canaan. This gives me great hope. So this is not a criticism. This is not running down. I'm just saying, thank God we're repeating this or else we'd have to wait until we do before we can go home. It's done deal. They've done it already. Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. When Moses was aroused to perceive the evil, the plots of the enemies had been so successful that not only were the Israelites participating in the licentious worship at Mount Peor, but the heathen rites were coming to be observed in the camp of Israel. And that's what the typology tells me. And so the anti-type must be the same. But the wrath of God was kindled. There's something coming, brethren. They were only going to observe, not participate. We have observer status, we're not members. Could it be that we could go even further? Could we exchange our observer status for membership? Or God forbid, even chair the meetings in the end? Is that possible? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> It is highly possible. On the banks of the Jordan and the children of Israel set forward and pitched on the plains of Moab on this side of Jordan by Jericho and Balak the son of Zippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many and Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. You know these, these Adventists, if we don't stop them they're going to steal all our sheep. We've got to make a plan. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, Exodus 3.1, the priest of what? Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. So this was family. This was family. How often I hear, they're exactly like us. They're, they're family. <laughs> the Protestants, there's no difference between them and us. No difference. I love this story. One of my stories, I know I've told it. I have lots of stories to tell you. But it was so, this was, you know, the young people would say, this was really cool. I was in this independent European country. And uh, I was giving lectures. And it was still early. They still tolerated me. And they had hired a Protestant hall. I think it was a Moabite. No, no, no it was just a pro <laughs> Protestant hall. And I was to give lectures on evolution creation. And... Uh, I was speaking to the leading powers within our church and they were saying there's no difference between us and them. None. I didn't mind the Protestant hall by the way. I don't mind what hall I speak in. But they had such good relations uh, they'd received this hall and they were proud of it. We've got the Protestant hall, a nice big one. you know. <laughs> These are our brothers and sisters. They believe just like us. And I said, no, they don't. Yes, they do. No, they don't. I said, they're Babylon and we're not. No, <laughs> brother, uh, you're stepping on toes here. They believe exactly like us, the president said to me. So off we went to the hall to discuss the details of how we were going to do it, where the projectors were going to be, etc., etc. And I walk into the foyer 
And there are the pictures against the wall. I think I've showed them in one of my lectures. Of Brahma breathing in and Brahma breathing out to show the creation of the world. And I looked at this stuff, which is Eastern mysticism. And I pumped this president and said, have you seen this on the wall? Oh, I'm sure it's just, you know, it's just figurative. It doesn't mean anything. They're exactly like us. And then we sp spoke to the head there, and we discussed what we wanted to do. And then he asked the question. This is now the chief man of these, this number one evangelical church in that country. And he said, by the way, what are you going to talk about? I was sitting, standing in a circle there in the foyer with the president here and the this here and the that there. And I said, uh, evolution, creation, yes, and what are you going to say? And I said, well, I'm going to show that uh, the evolution theory is not correct and that God created. He went totally stiff. Not in this hall. I said, yes, that's what I'm going to say. He says that I'm sorry, gentlemen, but the hall is cancelled. You can't have it. And this poor president nearly fell over. And he said, but why? We've gone to all the expense and we've, we've advertised and we've put out flyers and it's too late to change the hall. No, 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 no. We weren't going to be associated with some ridiculous story that God created. It's not going to happen here. And so he was terrified and I was delighted. And we argued and he argued and they looked for a compromise and eventually this uh, head of this church there said, all right, the compromise is that before every lecture you will have to announce that what you are going to present is not in harmony at all with the thinking of this denomination. I said, with pleasure. <laughs> with pleasure. And I took great relish to say, what I'm about to say, the denomination that owns this hall, which is the largest evangelical organization in this country, does not believe one word of what I'm going to say and distances itself from it. <laughs> and then I gave my lecture. Wasn't that fun? <laughs> oh, that was fun. So this is what happened. Moab was so afraid of the people because they were many. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro. He was a Midianite. So if crossing the Red Sea symbolized baptism by water, then crossing the Jordan must symbolize baptism by the Spirit. Does that make sense? The Moabites were filled with fear because of what the children of Israel had done to the giants of Bashan. And they appealed to the Midianites for help. So, two sister churches coming together. The Midianites were descendants of Abraham and the Moabites next of kin through Lot. <laughs> Zipporah and Jethro, the wife and father-in-law and Moses, were Midianites. Jethro was a priest of Midian. Thus, the two nations were sister churches of Israel. And my question to you is, do we have sister churches and two beasts, nations, as Christian kin at the end? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. Same in our day. And Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time, and he sent messengers therefore unto Balaam the son of Beor at Petor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, I pray thee, curse me, this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I might drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. I know that if you do this, it'll work. Come and do this for me. And you know the story. I don't have to repeat everything. It was impossible to curse what God had blessed. So to this day, the false...
prophet commends spiritual Israel while he actually wants to curse him. Have you noticed that? I'm always surprised. All these people that actually hate everything we stand for, if they say a prayer, they say, please bless. I've never been cursed by any one of them in any of their prayers. That's absolutely fascinating. Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes and the Spirit of God came upon him and he took up this parable and said, Balaam, and said, Balaam the son of Beor has said, and the man whose eyes are open has said, he has said which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open, how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. As the valleys are, they spread forth as gardens by the rivers of the side, as the trees of lime aloes which the Lord has planted. And he gives us wonderful, wonderful blessing to the people. He couched, he lay down as a lion, as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed he is he that blesses thee, and cursed is he that curses thee. Can't curse them. He has not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is amongst them. I wonder who this king is. That's Jesus. He's amongst us. So this is said of Israel in spite of their stubbornness. That tells me something about God. They just come through this serpent experience and God says there's no iniquity in them. By beholding the serpent on the pole, they had had a vision of Calvary. Unfortunately, we have the propensity to look away and be attracted by the shortness of a miniskirt. And the attractiveness of the Moabite and the Midianite ladies. The church. Those churches are so attractive to us. The rebels were still there, but God covered his eyes. Many false prophets had tried to halt the Advent movement. Kellogg, Canwright, Ford. Thousands of apostates like them who deny the pillars of Adventism and seek theatrics instead of truth. Satan's last efforts take place on the borders of Canaan. If it's blue, this is my rambling. This is how I try and fit this typologies together here with the help of some nice people in this church. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly, riding on an ass and upon a colt the foal of an ass. This king is Jesus, says Zechariah, who gives this shout amongst his people. God has a people in which all heaven is interested, and are the one object on earth dear to his heart. Let everyone who reads these words give them thorough consideration. For in the name of Jesus I would press them home upon every soul. When anyone arises, either amongst us or outside of us, who is burdened with a message which declares that the people of God are numbered with Babylon and claims that the loud cry is a call to come out of her, you may know that he is not bearing the message of truth. Receive him not. In spite of all of it, it's still God's people. That's what makes typology so beautiful. The message contained in the pamphlet called The Loud Cry is a deception. Such messages will come and it will be claimed for them that they are sent of God but the claim will be false. We've had many, many such claims and all of these things. You know, When I read all of these new prophets in the church, what do they say? The Lord is coming, prepare, get rid of your sins, da-da-da-da, nothing new. And because they say a few good things, everybody jumps on the bandwagon and swallows the poison with the good. There is but one church in the world who are at present time standing in the bridge. How many churches? One. And making up the hedge, building up the old west places, and for any man to call the attention of the world and other churches to this church, denouncing her as Babylon, is to do a work in harmony with him who is the accuser of the brethren. So if we show parallels of Baal Peor, this is in no way to say that this is not God's people. This is God's people. 
As those who have made stewards of means and ability, you have been misapplying your Lord's goods and disseminating error. The whole world is filled with hatred of those who proclaim the binding claims of the law of God, and the church who are loyal to Jehovah must engage in no ordinary conflict. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We all know those texts. Those who have any realization of what this warfare means will not turn their weapons against the church militant. And this is a very fine line that I'm walking here. Because people will maybe construe it as turning the weapons against the church militant. It's not. I'm calling people into the church militant in spite of what they see in the church. I'm doing this, as I've said repeatedly, because people are kept from union with this church because of the things they see. If they can understand the typology, they will run to the haven. Not that the church will save them, but there is a shout of a king amongst them in spite of it. So accusations of fanaticism, legalism, erroneous theories will be leveled against God's people. If you try and be straight and to do what is right, you'll have criticism from within and without. Every phase of fanaticism and erroneous theories claimed to be the truth will be brought in amongst the remnant people of God. There it is. It's going to be there. These will fill minds with erroneous sentiments which have no part in the truth for this time. Any man who supposes that in the strength of his own devised resolutions, in his intellectual might united with science or supposed knowledge, he can start a work which will conquer the world, will find himself lying amongst the ruins of his own speculations and will plainly understand why he is there. We cannot fight this battle with flesh and blood, but by the Spirit. Do you know what? I can present the most sophisticated argument on why creation is right, and not one will believe. You cannot convince people with argument. That doesn't mean you mustn't give argument. <laughs> give the argument. But it is the Spirit that convicts. And when the Spirit convicts, then the argument will be accepted. If the Spirit does not convict, the best argument in the world will not convince a person. So no oration will be able to convince anyone. It is God who convicts, lest we become puffed up. From the light given me of the Lord, men will arise speaking perverse things. Yea, already they have been working and speaking things which God has never revealed bringing sacred truth upon a leaven with common things. Issues have been and will continue to be made of men's conceited fallacies, not of the truth. They're coming into the church to confuse faith and sound judgment, demerit the great grand testing truth for this time. We must expect it. Never, never was there a time when truth suffered more from being misrepresented, belittled, demerited through the perverse disputings of men than in these last days. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. Men who want to present something original will conjure up things new and strange and without consideration will step forward on these unstable theories that have been woven together as a precious theory and presented as life and death question. Our church is going to have all of this. We'll be making of none effect the spirit of prophecy. We'll have people saying, oh, that's 19th century outdated literature. And it cannot be used for exegesis. The papacy as Antichrist is a childhood disease of early Adventism, a relic of early Protestantism. She was influenced by the margin of the King James Version. We cannot be dictated to by a woman with only three years of education. These are all things that I have to deal with personally in my life, so I'm not making it up. 
this is just a fact. We shall encounter false claims. False prophets will arise. There will be false dreams, false visions. But preach the word. Be not drawn away from the voice of God and his word. Let nothing divert the mind. The wonderful, the marvelous will be represented and presented through satanic delusions, wonderful miracles, the claims of human agents will be urged. Beware of all of this. Christ has given warning so that none need accept falsehood for truth. The only channel through which the Spirit operates is that of the truth. Our faith and hope are founded not on feeling, but in God. Definition of truth Thy word is truth. Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. All thy commandments are truth. Stick to those three, you'll be fine. And still God is leading out of people in spite of it. He has a chosen people, a church on the earth, whom he has made depository of his law. He has committed to them sacred trust and eternal truth to be given to the world. And he would reprove and correct them the message to the Laodiceans is applicable to the Seventh-day Adventists who have had great light and have not walked in the light. So we have this package deal on the very borders of Canaan. God's Spirit has illuminated every page of Holy Writ, but there are those upon whom it makes little impression because it is imperfectly understood. I'm fascinated that the great statements of our faith are sometimes written by the great apostates within our church. That boggles my mind. Because when I read them, they make perfect sense. They're quoted from the Bible. They look absolutely right. And as a conservative, Bible-believing Christian, I cannot find, fault them. I cannot fault our statements on creation. I cannot fault them. But they will not tolerate any change, any added emphasis except what comes from the Word. Until you understand how some of these people think, because what they say and present in their lectures is the direct opposite of what I see or any conservative will see in some of those statements. How do I reconcile that? And the answer lies in that they interpret it in a theistic evolution pattern. So the day that is mentioned there is not to them a 24-hour period, but a long period. So they put their own interpretation into each of those texts in the Bible. But if I had to add now the words in brackets, literal 24 hours, all hell would break loose. And so it's sometimes, just as it says here, they interpret the Holy Writ as they want to. And they make null and void the truths. And then because some of these mega, I'll, I'll call them by their name, apostates, <laughs> have written some of these statements, we think they are fit to be the professors in our universities when they preach error or teach error rather than truth. They slide into any position to suit the tenor of their feelings. Daniel and the Reformation must be studied as well as the other prophecies of the Old New Testament. No, forget about those. We don't need those. God will arouse his people if other means fail. Heresies will come in amongst them. Note this statement. God will arouse his people if other means fail. Heresies will come in amongst them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. God permits heresies in the church. <laughs> He's a clever God. I would never think of permitting heresies in the church to sift the church. Romans 8 verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good 
to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You know, when, when I recite this verse out of my head, I always leave that piece out. I don't know where I got that indoctrination from. I must really reinterpret, not reinterpret, but refix this verse in my mind. To them who are the called according to his purpose. That's important. A young tree can yield sweet fruit, but it takes an old tree to bear weight and swings and children and give shade to the weary. Just a thought that I, I'd stick with the old tree. <laughs> you know, these young little trees, oh man. The world has no right to doubt the truth of Christianity because they are unworthy members in the church. Don't look at the unworthy members in the church. Look at the truth. Look at the pinks. The tares closely resemble the wheat while the blades were green. But when the field was white for the harvest, the worthless weeds bore no likeness to the wheat. I'm just in this position where I've sat in some of these committees and have had the opportunity to note some of these things. And I listened to some of these eloquent professors and retired professors of our leading universities that blatantly deny creation, blatantly deny miracles, blatantly deny everything we stand for, or believe, or that I at least stand for and believe. And they can coolly and calmly present lectures to break down everything we stand for, and nobody does a thing. They stay honored. I asked at one of these meetings, excuse me, but I, I cannot handle this anymore. I would like to ask a question. Where are the stalwarts that believe in this and that believe in that and believe in a six-day creation that created our institutes that were supposed to stand for that chaired them? Where are they? They're retired. Uh, and what about these that preach the opposite? They're also retired. Why are they invited? It seemed so, so strange. I sat in committees with some of these people, and I thought to myself, I'm going to provoke this person to see if I can get a reaction. And I provoke them purposefully, not angrily, you know, just. Provoke him. See if you can get a reaction. I can't understand how someone in our church can even think like some of these people think. No reaction. None. Try this way, this way, that way. No reaction. You can't move them. So that's very hard for me to understand. I won't go in any, in any further detail than that. Let's leave it there. It's already too much said. The spiritual body is still in the church. Amidst the visible body. Their iniquities are covered by the spotless righteousness of Christ. Rebecca was beautiful. Husbands, love your wives. Pay no more attention to the apostates than Israel paid to Balaam. Ramblings of my mind. Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. They are not my problem. Cannot change their mindset. If they're not willing to have their mindset changed, leave them to God. They're not my problem. Do what you have to do. Leave the consequences to God. Set your face as flint and say, God, you are able to keep me from falling. Just keep going. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. I don't want these people to be punished. I want them to change. But if they don't change, what's going to happen? which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Whether those wages are money, 
or whether those wages are honor amongst men makes no difference. Like the one scientist said to me, you are destroying our good reputation with the scientific world. <laughs> yes, exactly. I want to destroy that reputation with the good scientific world. Not by being obnoxious, but by letting the truth do the cutting. Yeah, check out the facts. If you want to believe what you want to believe, then go ahead. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. I actually wrote that, as I said, to one of our leading figures. I said, if God should send you a donkey and you refuse to believe him, you could perhaps face the angel of the Lord. The great magician had tried his power of enchantment in accordance with the desire of the Moabites. But concerning this very occasion, it should be said of Israel what God has wrought. While they were under the divine protection, no people or nation, though aided by all the power of Satan, should be able to prevail against them. Wow. He couldn't do anything. I'm not going to read all of it, just the sublime and impassioned poetry of this one who really wanted the wages of wickedness. The king of Moab, now disheartened and distressed, exclaimed, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. Yet a faint hope still lingered in his heart, and he determined to make another trial. He now conducted Balaam to Mount Peor, where was a temple devoted to the licentious worship of Baal, their god. Interesting. I was wondering why this prophet didn't obey the voice of God. Oh, actually, God, I thought the Bible said that uh, he was allowed to go. And then God rebuked him with the angel. And that was hard to understand until my dear wife read it and said to me, no, 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 you're on the wrong track here. God said to, them, said to him, if they come to you, then go with them. But they left without him. They didn't come to him. And he longed for their wages, and so he saddled his donkey to go and catch them. And that's when he was rebuked. But anyway, that's another story. The king of Moab was disheartened. The faint hope was still in his heart. He now conducted Balaam to Mount Peor, where was a temple devoted to licentious worship of Baal, their god. Here the same number of altars were erected as before and the same number of sacrifices were offered, but Balaam went not alone as at other times to learn God's will. He made no pretense of sorcery, but standing beside the altars he looked abroad the tents of Israel and again he issued this blessing. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacle, O Israel. As the valleys are they spread forth as gardens by the river's side, as the trees of lime aloes. We've read it before. We don't have to go through the old thing. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He couched, he lay down as a lion, as a great lion. Blessed is he that blesses thee, and cursed that curses thee. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob neither any divination against him. So the only curse that can affect us is the curse of sin. Nothing. Nothing. And thou say unto them, Thus says the Lord God of earth, Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. Jeremiah 11.3 That's the only problem we can have. Having eyes full of adultery, says Second Peter, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and hearts, they have exercised with covetous practices cursed children, which have forsaken the right way, have gone astray, following the way of Balaam. We have it in our church. Our divorce rate is as high as any other denomination out there. There's something wrong. Disappointed in his hopes of wealth and promotion in disfavor with the king and conscious that he had incurred the displeasure of God, Balaam returned from his self-chosen mission. After he had reached his home, the controlling power of the Spirit of God left him and his covetousness, which had been merely held in check, prevailed. 
He was ready to resort to any means to gain the reward. He wanted money. He wanted money. I've already told the story. He returned to the land of Moab, laid his plans before the king. The Moabites themselves were convinced that so long as Israel remained true to God, he would be their shield. The plan proposed by Balaam was to separate them from God by enticing them into idolatry. And so we have these prophets who come and tell us, come and worship in our style. Let's do our style of worship. Now this is perhaps harsh, but I'm going to read it. It's blue, so I take the responsibility. Type meets anti-type. Surely God's people could not be taken enticed into Baal and Ashtarot worship? Surely the evangelical world with its all kinds of music, sensual worship, flowing robes, scanty clad glitter could not affect God's people today. Surely we would not perform debasing occult sexually explicit production of Michael Jackson's thriller at our youth gatherings complete with their perverse sexuality actions surely we wouldn't do that I could actually show you the video but I decided not to or leaders would not lead out in presenting the culturally relevant Genesis 2k or G2K, satellite extravaganza, with all kinds of music and theatrics reminiscent of the thunderous beat of saddleback theology. Surely the emotional tear-streamed faces endued, induced by Willow Creek sermonology would not be able to entice God's people away from the simple sublime, thus says the Lord. Surely a gospel reversal from seek ye first to first needs then joy gospel could not hoodwink a word-based people today. All these things are in our church because we're the anti-type and so they must be there. And that, as I say, makes me heave a sigh of relief. We're around Edom. We're on the borders of Canaan. We're in Baal Peor. The next thing is cleansing and across the Jordan. We've completed the entire journey of the antitypical Israel. There's nothing more to come than Canaan. So is this good news or is this bad news? It's good news, but it's sad news because there's something coming. Surely our leaders would not encourage a study of Loyola's spiritual exercises. Would it? Would they? Would they introduce it into our university curriculums? Surely we wouldn't study spiritual formation and sacred silence and have Jesuit-like retreats coupled with contemplative or body prayers. To introduce salvation by contortion rather than the simple relationship of trust and love which God wills for his people. Can't happen to our church. Surely our colleges would not be enticed in to introduce mega church theology and evangelistic techniques with the salvation by decibel or salvation by philanthropy messages. Surely we would not relate our theology and prophetic gift to the trash heap of the 19th century fantasies or childhood disease of Adventism in exchange for a moment's recognition as a true free sister church of Moab and the Midianites. Oh, we're so proud of that status. Free church. Surely we would not teach that God is no creator at all, but a master of the evolutionary art of advancement and enlightenment by crushing the opposition by survival of the fattest. Yes, indeed. Anything Israel could do, we can do better. I take responsibility because I've seen it and I can back it up. Everybody knows it. You can find it out too. Jeremiah 12.10, many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. 
They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Biblical. Jeremiah 23, 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore thus says the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, says the Lord. It's coming very soon. Very soon. Be ye separate. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned to him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice and all the princes of Moab, and he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I defy whom the Lord has not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. That is what God's people must do. We don't want that. So the promises of God are conditional to separation. Or am I reading this incorrectly? I think so. Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will shake, show ye, and I will make thee a great nation and I will bless you. Come out. Exodus 33, 16, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. It is essential that we do not mingle. That doesn't mean we become monks on a hill. We become evangelists for God. But we do not mingle. But I have said unto you, shall inherit the land, and I will give unto you to possess it, the land flowing with milk and honey, and I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. Over and over and over. Why don't we get this message? Wherefore come out from among them and be separate. Surely we would not sit in ecumenical councils, join the European Arce car, or heaven forbid, even some... Union presidents signed the Charter Ecumenica, which makes the Pope's apostolic succession essentially recognized. Surely we would not castigate those who preached the three angels' messages or those who warned against worldly liaison. Surely the Moabite and the Midianite women would not entice us into spiritual licentiousness and adultery. All of those things are in the church. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. We have whole churches that are celebration churches. And many of them, especially there in the Pacific, eventually leave us entirely. They start with that and they end with nothing. Balaam witnessed the success of his diabolical scheme. He saw the curse of God visited upon his people and thousands falling under his judgments. But the divine justice that punished sin in Israel did not permit the tempters to escape. In the war of Israelites, Israel against the Midianites, Balaam was slain. He had felt a presentiment that his own end was near when he exclaimed, Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. But he had not chosen to live the light of the righteous, life of the righteous, and his destiny was fixed with the enemies of God. We've got to be careful. So divine justice does not linger forever. While it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, hearken not your hearts, as in the provocation. So this is not an accusation, this lecture, this is an appeal. Seventh-day Adventists, we know what is right. We have the spirit of prophecy. We have the Bible. 
We have the example of the children of Israel. We are on the borders of Canaan. We have fulfilled every aspect of the typology. Will you not wake up and return to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind? And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'm reminded of the story when the Russian general marched into Berlin. And there were all the traitors. Not that I <laughs> am for uh, the Nazis at all, please. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm just using it as an example. There were all the traitors that had made it possible for them to come in when they saw the writing on the wall. You know, those who gave information and this and all of that. And when that Russian general came in, he called all of these people and they thought they were going to receive a reward. And when he had them all there smiling and ready to receive accolades from the Russians for all the help that they had given them, he said, line them up and shoot them all. Because if they can be that unfaithful to their own people, what will they not do to other people? Wow. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. This will be the final event on earth. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren the Midianite women. And you remember the story of Phinehas, son of Eliezer. Aaron high priest saw it, took a javelin in his hand. We've got to kill the licentiousness amongst us. We've got to kill the idolatry amongst us. We have to hang it up, cut off the head. That's the only way to deal with it. It was during a period of peace and security that Israel was enticed to sin. Our church has had such great opportunities. The iniquity, iniquitous practices did for Israel which all the enchantments of Balaam could not do. Hold up my goings in thy paths that my footsteps slip not. Uphold my steps in your paths that my footsteps may not slip. Isn't that nice? We need to get here. Now these things were our examples to their tent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Neither should we be idolatrous. Neither should we commit fornication. Neither should we tempt Christ. We have some very strange churches where some very strange things happen. Where married men don't sit next to married women, but all kinds of strange things happen. We have it all. Neither murmur ye as some of them murmured. All these things happened as an example. And let him who thinks that he stands consider, because he could fall. So progression of apostasy. Observe. Take part. Bring into the camp. It's all happened. Is it in your church? Do you see apostasy in your church? Is it in the camp? No reason to leave the church. Pray. Pray for these people. It was by associating with idolaters and joining in their festivities that the Hebrews were led to transgress God's law. So now it is by leading the followers of Christ to associate with the ungodly and unite in their amusements that Satan is most successful in alluring them in sin. Come out from among them and be separate. God requires of his people now as great a distinction from the world in customs, habits and principles as he required of Israel anciently. Come out. The warning given to the Hebrews against assimilating with the heathen were not more direct or explicit than are those forbidding Christians to conform to spiritual customs of the ungodly. Come out. Don't love the world. 
What do we bring into our homes through the modern media? Have you asked yourself that question? Don't we bring it, even if it's not into the church, into our very homes? We have to be so careful. Satan is using every means to make crime and debasing, debasing vice popular. We cannot even walk the streets of our cities without encountering flaring notices of crime presented in some novel or acted out in some theater. How much more so today? I have come to the conclusion we must Beware more and more and more of these things. Many of the amusements popular in the world today, even with those who claim to be Christians, tend to be to the same end as they did of the heathen. We have all these festivals, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. The loud cry. When that ship strikes the rock... When we come up against the Sunday law, there will be a mighty slaughter. And that angel says, come out of my people. Why? Because the nations are drunk and they've become a habitation of devils, foul spirit, every unclean of an hateful bird. And they've drunk all the wine of the wrath. Come out of what? And the rest of the people, the priests, we read in Nehemiah, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanims, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God. So if you want to know where to go to, go to a people that proclaims the law of God. If it seems apostate to you, that church, that's prophetic. Come in. Either we are separated unto the law of God or we are attached to the mark of the beast. One of the two. This is the only nation that has fulfilled every typology. And because we fulfill it is no reason to leave it. Being not of the world is the chief cause of persecution. And I want you to note this carefully. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Remember the word that I said to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Jesus was persecuted not because his enemies find fault in him, but because they could not. That's why he was persecuted. And the same will happen to God's people. The prayer of Jesus, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from evil. Remember, God allows apostasy in the church to separate. Our destiny depends on it. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of the people is not of the Father, but of the world. And this world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abideth forever. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And then the lesson that they had to learn while the serpents bit them is that this is only possible in Christ. And these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So if we look at the entire typology, can we all see where we are in the stream of time? It's over. It's typologically, we fulfilled every single iota of the type. Prophetically, Everything is in place. We are going home. And soon there will be a great slaughter. Beginning with the house of God. I pray that none of our people and none of the leaders involved in any of these things be amongst those people. Repent. Be separate. 
Love the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Amen.